today is um, definitely the most specific and probably the most complicated of the three lectures that I've done so far. I would say that um, if I was trying to loosely summarize what we've done, that the first one was kind of an introduction to basic principles and things that you should be thinking about while you're playing. Um, the second one was looking at sort of a specific attack attacking idea. Um, this is going to be largely about one opening. Um, we're going to stay pretty narrow, uh, but, um, you know, obviously I'll do my best to continue to apply general principles to this, but um, one of the most important things here is just learning, you know, some specifics about how to deal with this. Um, I think it's worth mentioning as we go along in this stuff, um, these, these lectures are all general on purpose. They are intended to give you some things to think about and hopefully some better understanding while you play. The unfortunate reality is that if you want to actually improve your playing strength, you have to spend an awful lot of time with a book of tactics and learning the patterns. Um, I have some recommendations, you know, for that stuff I'm more than happy to share. Um, and we can talk about that a little bit later on. But, you know, no video, nothing you see on any of these YouTube things, no matter who the player is, should be considered comprehensive. There's a lot of stuff that I'm going to completely ignore, even in the games that we look at. Why didn't they play this? And, and what's wrong with this move? Um, it's just impossible. You know, it, um, it's... Uh, there's a quote about chess that I remember that I'm a big fan of, which is chess is a game in which an insect can swim and a man can drown. Um, and I think, you know, that gives you some sense of why we have to avoid going too deep, you know, into certain things um, and why it's necessary to really invest a lot of time if you want to understand things more fully. Okay. Um, with, uh, without further ado, I'll maybe just do a quick check to see if anybody else is, okay, I'm going to periodically make sure we're not leaving people out in the waiting room. But, uh, yeah, let's get rolling. Okay, so, you know, we're going to talk today about the Sicilian defense, okay? And the Sicilian defense gets its name, um, well, first of all, it's called the defense because, uh, it's, is an opening for black, right? Generally speaking, you know, when white is making the first move into some particular line, that line will get the name attack or game. Um, you know, King's Indian attack, the Scotch game, the Italian game, these are all things that white can decide to play. If the first move of this particular line comes from a black, uh, a black decision, then usually that, that opening will be labeled with defense. Um, and then, of course, you know, you've got responses to those. Uh, you've got responses to those defenses and on and on and on. Um, the name Sicilian defense, I actually looked this up earlier, and now I confess it has completely fallen out of my brain. So you're all just going to have to sit here while I pull it back up again because I call it being interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, this game, this opening is incredibly old um, and, uh, you know, was first analyzed, right, in 1594, okay, well before the 1800s, well before Paul Morphy or any kind of world championship, anything like that, right? So this idea has been around forever. Um, it's one move, right? I don't think that's very hard to understand. Um, it's, uh, I think, originally got its name because of uh, a translation from one of those ancient texts that referred to it as the Sicilian game, right? And the name stuck. So there isn't really a lot of knowledge about where this name comes from because it was so long ago. But what's the idea? Well, basically, we should start by looking at right, other kinds of responses to the king's pawn. Now, first of all, why is the king's pawn good? Well, okay, you take some central squares, you open development for 
your queen and bishop, right? You make it faster for white to castle kingside. Okay, a lot of wonderful things. So the first and most obvious response by black is just to meet white where he is in the middle and to say, you're not going to be able to play d4 and get this big center. When black plays something else, okay, like the French defense, okay, or the Karo Khan defense, okay, or Alakine's defense, all right, or any number of other openings, in many of them, he gives white an opportunity to grab a lot of space, right? So here, for example, you know, white can play e5, and already black is experiencing some cramping. His bishop doesn't have any place particularly exciting to go to, right, except maybe e7. And the problem is that his king's knight is actually asking for the same square, right? Knight h6 is pretty rough because you can get captured and black's pawns are going to be spoiled, right? Already you can see there are some problems to solve. Um, this is very, very playable for black, but you can see why there are some problems, right? Um, in the Karo Khan, same thing, right? White can play e5 in advance, and black is already having space problems. Alakine really can get into some space problems, right? White can grab massive amounts of the center. Um, so, and then even um, Scandinavian, right, where black tries to just counterattack right away, well, white can now take the pawn, and if black tries to keep material equal, white has a nice easy move here, right? Who wants to go ahead and uh, shout that out? Shouldn't be too hard to find. C4. C4. Okay, interesting. So C4, actually, let's talk about this. Hey, John, can you open up? Uh, my friend might be waiting. I got him. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thank you, though. Um, yeah, so C4. Okay. Here's what's good about this, and here's what's not so good. We are attacking the queen, right, and sort of winning some time. But what you have to think about when you're making a move and attacking a piece is not only do you want to think about okay, I'm making an attack, but after that attack is over, since I hope we all can understand, Black's not going to leave his queen here, right? And if you're going to beat somebody because they left their queen here, I don't think you need chess strategy videos, <laughs> right? Um, the real question is, like, is this pawn good, right? So after something like uh, maybe just queen a5, right, is this pawn well-placed? And I would argue that it isn't because I really want to put my bishop on a dangerous diagonal like that, right? That's really what I would prefer to do. So this is sort of getting in my way a little bit. Now, I, I don't think that white's got any kind of real problem here. I don't think this is the kind of inaccuracy that's going to cost you the game, but it would be more accurate usually to try and develop. Knight to, right? knight to c3. Yeah, knight to c3. Same idea, you see? Same exact idea of attacking the queen. But now after, let's just play the same move, I'm very happy to have a knight out, right? This is absolutely what I'm trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. okay? All right, so yeah, I'm doing okay at keeping an eye on this so far. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so there, point being, I don't wanna spend too much time on these other openings, right? Of course not. Um, but there are flaws in a lot of these openings, right? And uh, I would say the basic flaw with e5, which seems to answer all of these criticisms, is just that it's very symmetrical. And I think probably most of you have played a game like this before. Like, it would not shock me to find that, uh, you know, everybody, maybe even, um, you know, here and then something like this and castles and here and... You know, and basically what I find, a lot of my students have this game over and over and over again, and they really just don't know what to do. And they're, this is a chess game, you can play it, but the game is so symmetrical and everybody's occupying so many of the same squares, it can really be hard to understand how to get an interesting game out of it, right? How to, how to do anything except make a, make a bunch of trades and hope for the best. So the Sicilian, 
represents an opportunity to create imbalance right off the top. Black says, okay, you're going over there. I'm going over here. I'm still going to prevent you from getting this big center. I'm still going to do a classical thing. But now, if you want to proceed normally, I'm going to be able to get rid of one of your center pawns. Okay, and we're going to look at this. I think I'm going to look at this a little more later. But one of the things that you want to notice in terms of understanding the Sicilian defense right off the top is that in what is called the open Sicilian, where white goes for this move, um, that black has more center pawns. And that doesn't mean a whole lot at this phase of the game. It's not very important now. But if you get to an end game, black will have an advantage because of his extra muscle in the center. My coach um, says to me regularly that if you're playing white and you don't checkmate black, you're probably losing in the Sicilian. So that's just something sort of interesting to understand on a basic level. It is not something where white wants to trade everything off and try and keep pushing black around. That probably won't work out. And what I frequently, by the way, just in terms of easy mistakes to make, you know, let's say that white just decides to, you know, be trade happy and take everything. You can actually see now that black's central pawn advantage has gotten even bigger. All right, so this would be a really obvious and normal mistake that I see newer players make, right? Just, oh, we'll just trade everything. What harm could it do? Okay, um, so, you know, that's, that's sort of a little bit. Now, a couple of statistics here, right? The Sicilian defense also is both the most popular and the best scoring defense to E4 to the King's Pawn. Um, there's some stats on its success, right? Um, white scores better with D4 largely because of games with the Sicilian dragging the successful stats down. Okay. And uh, then I had this quote from John Rousen, who is a fabulous chess author that I love a lot. Right. And uh, one of the things that he talks about in here is um, the same thing I was talking about. Right. Okay. I'll let you open the position and develop your pieces aggressively, but you have to give me one of your center pawns. So this is kind of the absolute basic idea. Okay. Of the Sicilian. Now that's one problem. Okay. White accepting this, end game inferiority. A second problem, we get a couple of people coming in. A second problem is that there are an unbelievable amount of options for black to play and they're all called the Sicilian. This is the Sicilian, which means that anything that happens after this that is at all a reasonable idea has been tried and is called the Sicilian. <laughs> so, you know, frankly, I spent more time on this lecture than I did on either of the other two, and probably more than I even will on the one next week, because I was being asked to do a video on the Sicilian, and to do that just felt so incredibly overwhelming. I mean, just to give you a, a sampling, right? Once white goes for the open Sicilian, okay, black will typically play, um, knight to f6, which of course hits this loose e pawn. And uh, this was the purpose behind d6 also was to keep that pawn from being able to lunge forward. Okay, so white will usually play knight to c3. And from here, okay, we can do a dragon setup. This is called the Sicilian dragon. Okay, so named because of the Draco-like structure of the pawns. Okay. Um, and that would look, you know, something like this, okay, where usually both sides castle to opposite ends of the board, white will chuck his H pawns up, and black will try and use the open C file and this amazing dark squared bishop, right, to try and checkmate white. Very, very sharp, okay? <clears throat> he can play uh, the most hilarious, difficult to pronounce word in chess, um, the Skavanigan, or the Skavanigan, or the Scheveningen. I've heard it so many different ways. Um, this is a more flexible setup, right? Where he just sort of, you know, develops his king side and waits a little bit more. Um, he can play uh, Nidorf Sicilian. 
Um, he can play <laughs> uh, probably – there are a few that I'm not – oh, uh, a Sveshnikov, okay? Or he can play this a move earlier, and it's called the Kalashnikov. It's like kind of outrageous how many different things that Black has tried. So I didn't want to do any of this. Um, I've been, you know, playing this game for a very long time, and it took me a long time to arrive at an opening for white that I could enjoy playing, that I didn't feel completely overwhelmed by. So I'm going to show you my approach, which is basically to not go in for any of that and to play what is called the closed Sicilian. So let's get into it. Okay, so I could play knight to f3 and then try and open with d4. The closed Sicilian begins with knight to c3. Now this move makes a lot of sense, okay? I am going to, as you're going to see shortly in a couple of turns, slowly develop my king side. In order to do that, I want the center to remain closed. I don't want a bunch of pawn exchanges and for black to come rushing at me after he's finished his development. So this move is useful because it makes sure that this pawn exchange cannot happen, right? At least temporarily. Obviously black can really go for it right away, okay? And, and try and lunge, you know, directly for that move. But this is a way of slowing that down, okay? Now after something like d6, right, white will then play g3. And we can see I've labeled with arrows here sort of the, the basic idea of the setup, okay? I'm going to put my bishop on the long diagonal. I'm going to advance, right, my d-pawn um, to help support my e-pawn. This also helps you, hopefully helps to clarify why the bishop needs to find another way to go, right? With this pawn played up, the bishop's going to want a different diagonal to use, okay? And then the idea will be to attack on the king side with f4. So looking at this a little more simply, we frequently get a structure like this, okay? Sometimes it's helpful to just look at the essential elements of a position in order to better understand them. I Actually, one of the things I wanted to mention today was we're talking about the Sicilian defense, but... I'm hoping to make it clear as we go through how to apply these things to any opening you want to learn. And one of the things that I highly recommend is getting a little ways into a game, taking the pieces off the board and just looking at where the pawns are. So one of the things we can see here is that there's a kind of a battle going on where black is grabbing all of the dark squares, right? And white is kind of just going ahead and doing the opposite thing with the light squares, okay? That's one element that we need to consider. So, you know, for example, getting rid of some of the clutter, um, the d5 square is going to end up being really important for both sides, right? White is currently controlling it and probably going to be backing it up. Black is going to want to wrestle for that. On the other side, the d4 square okay, is on white's half of the board. So that's not a square that white wants to give up so easily. Okay, so these are just some typical things. Oh, one more element you should always be looking at. Um, which direction is your pawn chain pointing? So we see here, white's got this pawn chain C2, D3, E4, very clearly pointing an arrow towards the king side. Okay, black is very clearly pointing the other way. This is pretty much how these games go, right? White is going to play f4 and launch an attack right at black's king, and black very typically will be playing things like b5, b4, c4, right? And using rooks over here, rooks the queen, etc., to try and create play on the queen side. This is, by the way, another reason why the Sicilian is so popular. It leads very frequently to these kinds of unbalanced, dynamic, interesting positions where there isn't going to be a draw. Someone's going to win and someone's going to lose. So some of the appeal has to do with its success, but some of it is also just that it's more fun to play, right? The, the positions are very dynamic and interesting. 
but also very difficult and intimidating. So, you know, that, that interest comes at a price. Okay, a few more looks at just some basic diagrams here. Um, you know, I've just added bishops here so we can see some things. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out with this one was Black's bishop is better suited right now to this entire task than White's. This bishop, right, because it's running into its own pawn, is more actually useful in defense, right? Black's dark squared bishop can be an incredibly powerful attacker, and especially in the, the versions of the Sicilian where White castles this way, it's often, right, somebody giving the lethal dose. Um, White's piece doesn't seem as impressive, but it's very important as the attack goes on, especially because we're going to be launching so much of our natural pawn cover at the king, it's very useful to have this piece here, making sure that some of these squares are defended. Okay, and then the last one uh, that I have here is just showing, right, the advance of this F pawn, making contact with the black position, right, which with the addition of a few helpful pieces to give it some shape, right, you can start to see some basic plans, right? So white has advanced his F-pawn. Um, white will often use this little battery to try and trade off this key defender, okay? At which point, right, if we can get rid of this dark squared bishop, hopefully this is reasonably clear, like these dark squares around the king start to become a little weaker. This structure that looks so impregnable without this bishop, right, becomes a lot airier, okay? And then I just included one brief uh, tactic from one of my games to illustrate the point. So here we can see this position's very different, right? We're in a, a late middle game end game where white has played, to be honest with you, pretty terribly. Um, I was incredibly lucky to do well in at the end of this game, because you can see, right, black is uh, coming with these, these pass pawns that are very difficult to stop. You know, they're connected and protecting each other, right? And he's uh, also got an extra rook, okay? But without this dark squared bishop, right? I made a trade earlier in the game. There's this weak square and there's this weak square, okay? So let's see if we can just briefly, you know, conduct an attack here. Anybody got the first move? Who's move? White to play. Knight to f6. So knight to f6. Okay. This is a pretty big blunder on my opponent's part, right? I mean, this, uh, he had played well up until this point. I don't know. He, people miss things. Okay. So he's already got massive problems here because... You know, winning the rook is is good, but but frankly, these pawns are um, still very scary, right? And if he can get, you know, if he can manage to pick the knight back up, I think he'll probably be okay, right? So, you know, the problem is after king to f8, right? This knight doesn't just grab the rook; it also wins the queen. So that's his first issue. Okay? <laughs> so he goes here, All right? And now. What, what do you think white should play here? I would just grab the rook. I'm sure it's wrong. <laughs> Anybody have a different idea? <laughs> Speak up. Uh, queen a4? Uh, queen h4, rather. H4. Queen h4. Queen h4. All right. So let's, let's talk about Bill's idea first, right? That's what I, Bill, you were, thank you. You were an excellent student. You knew the trap I wanted someone to fall into, and you decided you were gay. <laughs> a guy who makes you money. Yeah. So, you know, knight to d7, right, winning the rook actually only picks up the exchange because um, now, at the very least, right, I should have queen to c6. So it won't be a free rook after all, right? After something like this, you know, I can at very least get my piece back. And now, okay, you know, materially, white has gained some. I mean, we were down the exchange and now we're equal, except of course for these two connected pass pawns and we're probably still dead. Um, we've also lost a monster knight, right? This knight, uh, I think the saying about a knight on the uh, sixth rank is a, a bone in the throat. I think that I've got that quote correct, right? So we've sacrificed something really nasty, okay? So instead, 
we say, I don't want the rook. I'm playing for checkmate. And the threat, this is just mate and one. Okay, and remarkably, actually, impossible to stop. Okay, um, my opponent went from completely winning the game to suddenly losing because of the power of this attack. Now, he played, you know, realistically, you could sacrifice peace. Okay, but um, I think even here, you know, I'm continuing to attack you. My threat is to just get out of the way and keep coming, right? And g5, I don't think is any help because I can just keep breaking the wall down. And again, it's going to take me a little while, but I am, I am getting in. Okay, so my opponent tried h5, and this move is really very, very simple, and I just think it's kind of beautiful in its perfect simplicity. What does white play here? Queen g5? Yeah, we just step around it. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's just, it's no barrier at all, right? And um, I think, let me see here, my opponent struggled on for a little bit. I think uh, that he managed to find a way to stay alive. Let me see if I can remember. Um, it's knight f5 the only thing? Yeah, knight f5, right, takes, no, you know, king here, but after pawn here, right, he resigned. Um, because it may not be, I mean, for one thing, right, uh, if he goes this way, then very, very simply, right, queen h6. And now he can block, but I have so many attackers, it will not make a difference. All right, that's just checkmate. Notice that he cannot run away because of this monster knight. And if he goes the any other way, who remembers? Knight captures, wins the queen. Oh, yeah. D7, knight d7. Yeah, exactly, and we pick up the queen. In reality, you can probably actually play for checkmate here, um, and that's even better. But um, especially in a game situation, practical decision-making, right? There's no reason not to just take what the guy offers you, you know? Like, let's just do this, win the queen, and we should be able to sort of go home. Um, but, you know, if you got a lot of time on the clock and you want to try and figure it out, I think, um, I think after this, we should have mate. Um, because notice, like, king tries to run, that's checkmate. And if, oh, that's actually the only move, isn't it? Yeah, okay, so there you go. <laughs> okay, so just just uh, not, you know, a little bit of a bonus thing here. We're not looking at the rest of the game, but I wanted to give you an idea of how it is that you can conduct an attack in these positions. Okay, on to, oh, any questions so far about any of that? Yeah, so the, the move that I see a lot when I play Sicilian, if you go back to the uh, opening. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. Hang on. Bishop C4. Oh, so you play as black. Yeah. Got it. Got it. <laughs> uh, well, that'll probably, be, that'll probably be outside the scope of, um, of today's lecture, to be completely honest with you. Um, I sort of looked more at white approaches, but maybe maybe we can look more at some some options for black in a future video. I you know Fisher used to play this. I don't actually think that it has any special reason to be um, too intimidating. You know, one of the things that black is typically trying to do in this opening is expand on the queen side, right? Seeing our earlier point, right? I mean, uh, oh, I have not mentioned this yet today, but one of the other basic things you can hang on to from today that I find very useful, um, take your most forward pawn, whoever it is, right? For white, it's e4, for black, it's c5, and get him a buddy, okay? So, you know, in, in black's case, either b5 or d5 are both moves we want to play because they start creating this structure, right? where we can have this, you know, as I call it, the snowplow, right? Two pawns that are able to keep advancing and pushing people around the board. So this bishop c4 move, right, we have to watch out for f7. But, you know, after something like a6 right away and play for a fast b5, right? But also we have just ideas of like playing e6. And okay, we're gonna have a little bit of trouble with this e5 pawn bothering my knight. But on the other hand, 
none of these checkmate ideas are happening, right? We don't have any of those traditional worries. Um, and we can probably play for a very fast D5 to try and strike out of the bishop, okay? So that's, that's just a little bit. I, I think if I'm going to deal with that in more depth, I'd have to, um, you know, I'd have to chop off some of the end of today. So, but uh, that's something. Any, anything else? <coughs> I'll take that as a no. <laughs> okay, uh, very good. Okay, so let's, let's look at this, uh, you know, in more practice, right? So I've got a game here. Um, I've got two games, you know, we'll see. Ooh, right. We'll see. I, uh, if, if there's time, you know, I'll get to the second one. But this game is played between Boris Spassky and Afim Geller from 1968. So who is Boris Spassky? So Spassky is, well, does anybody remember this name, recognize this name? Anybody know who this guy is? Fisher Spassky. Yes, exactly, right? He was Fisher's opponent in 1972. So, um, you know, not a bad guy to look at the week after we looked at a Bobby game. Um, so who is this guy? So first of all, right, the, the most interesting thing to note about Spassky is that he is kind of Fisher's opposite in any number of ways. Um, he was a product of the Soviet machine, right? He first learned how to play chess on, uh, at 10 years old, right? Oh, excuse me. <laughs> I got my numbers wrong. Right? He learned to play chess at the age of five on a train evacuating from Leningrad uh, during World War II, okay? He, from the age of 10, was getting lessons from Soviet masters, right? He became part of their player development machine. Um, Soviets were world champion uh, winners. You know, they held the world championship exclusively for something like 30 or 40 years uh, before Bobby broke that line in 72, and Spassky was one of them. Okay, um, he was an excellent player. He was sort of considered a universal player. He had a lot of skill in the opening middle game, end game, and, you know, fast attacking positions, but could also play slowly and positionally. Um, he was a gentleman. One of the more famous acts of sportsmanship in chess was in 72 after Fisher won an amazing game against him. And uh, the game ended and the audience applauded. Spassky actually joined the crowd in applauding Fisher for how well he had played, which, you know, is, is not common. Um, so, you know, compared to, um, compared to Fisher, right, he was um, Night more, G8, stable, F6. more stable, um, more gentlemanly, but also perhaps a little bit less talented, right? But he did become world champion, um, but he only held it for three years. Um, so that's, that's probably as much as we need to say. He also, by the way, one more thing about Spassky, he played the closed Sicilian a lot. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention today to be sure to say was, if you're trying to learn an opening, go find the players who play that opening and study their games, right? See how the great players did it and see what worked and what didn't, okay? So uh, let's get into this thing. Okay, so e4, c5, knight c3, like we talked about, controlling d5. Okay, black decides just to play for more standard development ideas, right? No kind of immediate confrontation. We have g3, knight to c6. Most of this, I think, is not too hard to understand, right? We can see how black is just developing his pieces, following principles, but also more specifically, reaching for control over these dark squares, right? Like we talked about, okay? White develops his bishop on the long diagonal and black says, okay, well, it's consistent strategy. Certainly, right, we could play this way as well, right? But black considers it very often good strategy with such a pawn structure to say, why don't I move the bishop to work with this rather than playing e6 and having a more you know, flexible, but also um, less consistent pawn structure, right? 
So this is, you know, sort of why this is so typically played, okay? And we see the immediate idea of expanding with F4. Notice we actually delay the development of the King's Knight because as much as we do need to develop our pieces, okay, this would get in the way in the immediate sense of some of this expansion that we're trying to do. Certainly if we play knight to F3, right, we can't then play F4 without having to make another couple of moves. So we just go for it right away. Now there are other ways to play in this opening, right? We can also go for something like a more gradual setup with bishop e3, knight to e2, right? Castles and, you know, play slower with this f4 move or some other ideas. But we're going to be just looking at this one today. Okay, knight to f6. Developing, right? Controlling some squares. This knight, um, sometimes black will place it on e7. It can become a target because black knows, of course, that white's expansion is coming, but it's also very actively placed. So there are always trade-offs in chess, right? This is no exception. Okay, black castles. And now here's where we start to see black playing for this counterplay. Okay, rook to b8, trying to get this move in as fast as possible, right? a6 followed by b5 would also be all right, but by playing the rook to b8, we accomplish a couple of useful purposes. Number one, we're getting our piece involved, right, with the attack and not making several pawn moves. Um, number two, sometimes the bishop's actually gonna come to a6 and use this diagonal. Number three, you never know when that might be a problem. <laughs> and so just by, you know, eh, we're just gonna go ahead and get our rook someplace where it's not on the line and uh, keep out of trouble, right? Keep his nose clean, okay? H3, um, playing for uh, G4, coming next, right? We're just getting this slow buildup. There aren't, there aren't a ton of tactical shots in this opening, right? Later on, as things open up, we'll see a couple of things, but um, one of the things that characterizes this opening that I love about it, but does make it very complex, is you notice nothing has been exchanged. We actually have all eight pawns for both sides, right? Both knights, both bishops, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody's still on the board. So this leads to really interesting, dense chess and dense positions, but it also means there's a lot to consider at any moment, okay? Um, so black comes with this expansion. Um, this is another actually instructive moment in the game because Spassky plays a3 here, okay, which is another one of these not exactly setting the world on fire moves, but his idea is to slow down black's attack a little bit on the queen side, right? It's very important, even though we're going to try and sort of go for glory and checkmate black over here, you don't want to just completely ignore what's happening on the queen side. You can't afford to just let your opponent have everything he wants and go for glory. There's actually a game which I'm only going to click through very quickly, but another player that we could do several hours on, right, Mr. Gary Kasparov, okay, had this game. And you're going to see the similarities, right, immediately. But uh, Kasparov, right, a, a later world champion and an unbelievable, probably the greatest player who ever lived, right? Um, I mean, I, he couldn't beat Carlson right now, but in his prime, okay? And the only reason I wanted you to look at this briefly was just basically white makes absolutely no moves at all to slow down black's counterattack on the queen side. And as a result, okay, black actually ends up breaking through first. And what we see, right, although things are granted pretty complicated in here, is that all of Black's pieces get to glory long before White ever gets there, okay? And White ended up getting made it, okay? So that game deserves its own study, but I just wanted to demonstrate this point of, you know, just because you've learned a new toy doesn't mean you get to stop playing chess. You have to take time to account for what your opponent is up to. Okay, so that's the sort of learning principle behind this idea of playing A3. Okay, A5, again, I'm playing over here. 
consistency in strategy. Okay, bishop to e3, just finishing his development, right, and also having options of exchanging off on an important square. Okay, and just like I talked about, here comes the b4 push, and I'm able to trade and give my rook something to be happy about. Okay, my knight's got to go away. Um, black develops a piece right onto the long diagonal to uh, help pressurize. Okay, I think a6 is a place we want to be, but um, because of this c4 idea that we saw briefly in the Kasparov game, but uh, you can see that's not happening at the moment. Okay, another, another nice prophylactic move by Spassky. Right, he plays b3 and just kind of slows down the counterattack. Um, actually, okay, one more instructive point here. I just want to look at something. So, you know, it, it might occur to people in this moment after playing this move, maybe some of you are paying attention to the long diagonal, and I just wanted to note that there might be sort of sacrifice ideas, right, of, um, you know, opening the diagonal and then winning this rook. Okay, which, okay, two pieces for rook and pawn, six points for six points, right? That should be at least an equal trade. Um, my question to you all is, is should black go for this? But more importantly, you know, why or why not? Anybody want to hazard? The uh, bishop, um, uh, the black star scores bishops is gone and it was good. You might want to hang on to that discovery and uh, see if it's still there. And also, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I can close this in the short term, right? It's very important to notice, like, of course, you can play f6, and the immediate weakness of the queen coming into the, the back of the theater, as I always say, right, it can be solved. But, you know, this dark squared bishop is going to be able to run unopposed for the rest of the game. Um, and in order to, you know, shut this diagonal down, you also have to move yet another pawn, which... Every time your pawns move, it's a little bit harder for them to move again, right? Not only because they run out of squares, but also because there's more and more space behind them, right? And they get more and more brittle. Um, so this would be something that white would be very, very happy with, right? I mean, f5 and the bishop coming to h6 and the knight maybe coming into g5, right, or things like this would be more than enough to compensate for the fact that he's lost this rook. Okay, so that was just something that I thought was kind of an interesting instructive point. Okay, <clears throat> black now plays rook to a8. Um, white has, you know, some decisions to make here. Generally speaking, um, it's a bad idea to exchange, okay? Um, this is sort of like the, the normal principle that we are taught is when you are wrestling over an open file, if you take first, if you sort of blink first, then at least on a temporary basis, you are ceding the file to your opponent. Now, there's always specifics in play, right? And in this case, maybe, um, you know, the engine doesn't like uh, what Spassky plays here, maybe because taking would have saved him some time. But um, I think it's, you know, important to recognize why it is that we don't want to make that exchange. So Spassky does something kind of interesting, which is he actually ducks off the file so that he can keep this pawn here to guard C2. Okay, he knows that this attack will come eventually, right? Even if this rook was exchanged, this attack will be coming with the other pieces. As you'll see, it's going to develop in the game. Okay, and he wants there to be somebody minding the store so that his queen is free to pursue some of the attacking ideas that we saw in the earlier tactical example and very briefly in the uh, Kasparov game. Okay, so here comes rook to a2. G4. Easy enough to see what this move is about, right? We're going to take the queen and we're going to tuck her over here. Queen to A8, coming in on, on my main means of advantage. E1. Queen to A6. Okay. A hard one. 
um, provided that you are not uh, spying ahead. Okay. What happens if white plays queen h4 right now? Not an easy tactic. Let's even put it on board. Oh, um, so you would um, stop the uh, rook. Rook two takes c2. Rook takes c2 is actually probably even better, right? So what's your idea, Chip? What's the follow-up? I and mean, I'm going I'm to take that rook, right? Uh, yeah. I, 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 for a minute there, I, I didn't see the rook on f1. So <laughs> yeah. Queen captures d3. Yeah. So, yeah, no, Chip, you're not wrong, though. Look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't doubt yourself. Right. Okay, we've now got, you know, the rook is hanging on c2, and the bishop is hanging with check on e3. Okay, and this pawn is also dropping. So this, this is a very strong counterattack by black and just the kind of crash through that we were trying to avoid, right? That we constantly have to be on the lookout for. But I think a little bit simpler in this position. Did anybody see the other idea that's a little bit simpler? Knight captures on e4. Very good, Brian. Yes, knight takes e4. Okay, and the idea is very simple. This knight is loose. Okay, so... Um, you know, I'll do some, some things probably on simpler um, material <laughs> coming up. And one of the things that I always want to emphasize to my students um, is just look for loose pieces, right? There is a saying, another one that I'm very fond of, many sayings in chess, you know, 1,500-year-old game. Um, loose pieces fall off. Loose pieces fall off the board. Okay, and this is no, no exception, right? This knight is on e2, he's loose. We left him behind when we played queen h4, the departure effect, right, from last week. After pawn takes, just queen e2. And again, not only did we pick up a pawn in the trade, but the queen is in your house, right? And the bishop is hit. And uh, also notice that after something like, uh, for example, um, bishop f2, Maybe I can grab here right away. I have to be a little careful because I think maybe knight g5 there is very strong. But um, more importantly, I can now start to battle over this square, right? And, of course, just very simply taking on c2 is also very good. Okay, so white's queen side is just completely falling apart. And he's so close to having these attacks start to hit home, right? But he didn't quite get there. All right, so that's the battle, and that's the learning curve with this sort of thing. And, Neil, to your point, right, about, um, about playing black in these positions, this is, you know, also hopefully serving as an illustration of what to do. Um, I myself actually stopped playing the Sicilian uh, a number of years ago because I had so much trouble playing against white with the closed. So that was part of the reason that I ended up picking it up myself was that, you know, generally it's – a good attitude on my part to say, if you can't beat them, join them. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so queen f2 might not look like anything, right? We're not going towards this plan that we've been looking at, but Spassky is essentially just playing a little bit of a waiting move because you'll notice that this actually holds off all of these tactics. The knight is not loose, right? And uh, same thing here. Now suddenly we only have one loose piece, right, instead of two. So we just moved the rook, for example. Maybe actually we can even do this so that we don't hang the pawn, but we might even be okay with that, with losing the pawn. Yeah. Um, because we, oh, you know what's a nice move here, actually? Maybe, um, maybe knight to c1. Maybe that holds everything. Although maybe now e4 drops. It's a, it's a little bit messy still, but you know, uh, black's given us a whole rook. So I'm going to go ahead and say that we're okay. Okay. Uh, backing up a step here. Knight to a7. Okay, seeking to reroute into some of these, uh, well, not so much this one. I guess we already had access to that. But trying to come down into uh, c3 and a3, okay, to attack this way. Particularly a3 to attack this c2 pawn. Now, finally, white's attack gets underway. Okay, knight to b5, of course. F takes. 
How should Black take back here? Oh, uh, with the F pawn. Why? Uh, because then uh, the rooks lined up with the queen. Okay. This makes perfect sense. Unfortunately, it's wrong. Oh. Right? But it, it's very, very logical. And that's exactly why I asked. Right? So this is very tempting and good. I mean, we're, we're all taught to, um, you know, focus on the uh, development of our pieces. The problem is that after F takes, right, we've already, White has already got ideas about using this square. Departure effect. Right? There was an F pawn guarding E6, and now there isn't. So here comes knight to F4, and I'm already threatening to come in. Okay, now uh, I hope it's obvious why that's not going to work. <laughs> right? Okay, now I've got two knights on the problem. Right? But even um, maybe something more logical like this, right? I can still play this knight to G5, and now I've got two ways to come in. Does that make sense, Brian? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very good, and thank you. That was, I mean, I figured that that's what people would think, which is why I asked the question. It's a very, very interesting moment there. So, okay, so he's kind John, of forced. Sorry? Sorry, John, to interrupt you. Uh, Please. I recall dimly uh, some rule that's probably the exception rather than the rule that whenever possible, one should take toward the center. Is there any truth to that? Yeah. Absolutely, yes. Um, absolutely, pawn should take towards the center. Um, what I would say... Um, what I would say here, Bill, is that is a good, you know, there's a, another thing I wanted to mention today, actually, which you've just teed me up for. So there's this Philidor quote that I love. Um, we don't need to get into, you know, he's a chess player, grandmaster, great player. Um, Philidor has a quote that says, uh, in the end game, the rook always belongs behind the passed pawn, except when it is incorrect to do so. <laughs> and I think... You know, if you can embrace the spirit of that quote, then you're going to be able to psychically survive the frustration of chess. Um, because I would say here, yes, right? Capturing towards the center makes a certain amount of sense. Um, absolutely. But there are other positions that I could show you in which white is conducting these attacks and taking this way is the fatal loss because it allows white to reach all the way to the back of the theater, like I was talking about, you know? So these, these principles that we have are very good and very important, but they always have to be bashed up against the analysis of a particular position, uh, which leads me to another point I wanted to make about how to learn an opening. Be willing to embrace losing. Um, go out, you know, pick an idea, pick something. Maybe you like this, maybe you like some other approach. Okay, um, I'm a big fan of trying to play something that um, is forcing. And, and what I mean by that is, um, okay, I'm going to totally go off on a tangent here for just a second before we get to the climax of this game. Uh, think of it as a commercial break. <laughs> but hopefully this is, this is useful to people. So, like, you know, when I play against D4, when I'm playing black, I play the Dutch. And one of the reasons, now, first of all, you might notice actually that there's a lot in common with the Sicilian, right? That's um, playing the Dutch is sort of like playing a, a Sicilian in reverse. Okay. Um, but the reason that I like this so much is because you can, I'll give you an example, right? I used to play this opening called the Nimzo Indian. And the idea behind the Nimzo Indian is after knight goes to c3 to play bishop to b4. And I'm not going to get into why, it's just this is like the typical idea. And what I found over and over and over again was that I kept having these games where white would do this, right? And okay, you know, you can see the engines telling me what to play right now. We'll shut that off. But, you know, you immediately have to end up playing these other pawn structures and these other plans, which are nothing to do with the Nimzo, Right? You don't get typical play if white is determined. And so I like to go and find openings that I say, you know what, no matter what, we're going to be in something that's Dutch-like because I've made this incredibly committal move. And there are weaknesses to this move, right? There's this long diagonal we have to worry about. We saw this in a two lecture, uh, last lecture, right? Weak diagonal. But darn it, 
I am going to play something that I can call the Dutch and that I can go look up in a book about the Dutch and I can figure it out. Right. So that's just, you know, nothing to do with anything, but I highly recommend if you're somebody who's coming here and you're like, what do you mean openings? I just like make moves, right? If you're going and trying to find an opening that you'd like, I highly recommend trying to find something that you can get over and over, <laughs> you know, something you're going to be able to repeat and not dumping a bunch of hours into learning something that you only get to play if they play a certain way, you know? So we can talk more about that in more detail, you know, with people individually, but okay. Back to Mr. Spassky and Mr. Geller. So he takes with the H bomb. That was the point. Okay. Knight to G5. Getting more pieces around the king. Okay, we see that this square is being reached for. What does that matter? Well, okay, knight to a3, queen to h4. Does anybody see already how we could get a potential checkmate here? If the knight's gone, then... Yeah. yeah. So what do we do about it? Uh, take him to rook. Yeah, right? We're threatening to sack the rook on f6 and play checkmate. Okay, right, what a tactic called removing the guard. Okay, removing the guard, right? We uh, work through a logical process. I wanna do this, he's stopping me. Okay, what can I do about that? Okay, so um, obviously Keller, a grandmaster, sees this kind of coming, right? And plays rook to c8, so that after Spassky's idea, right, I'm okay, I can, I can tuck the king away on f8. And now here comes the move that honestly is completely beyond what I was trying to do with these lectures and kind of ridiculous, but uh, you know, where's the fun in just looking at normal things all the time? <laughs> um, does anyone, I'll, I'll give one person one guess. I, I realize that it is 1.30 uh, already. What, is, what does Spassky play here to get in? 96. Knight e6 is close to the right spirit. Um, I think Spassky thought, why leave a pawn on the board, right? So knight e6, probably, right, f to e6. I think this would actually, yeah, this would be good enough, right? Followed by uh, knight to f4. I think you're probably still getting in, right? Spassky was even more direct. Yeah, that's pretty good, though. I think uh, white is winning here. Right, there's just too many weaknesses and we've got a lot of pieces coming in. Notice I'll probably be able to bring this guy in on the F file at some point. Okay, and you know, the, the problem with Black's commitment to this overwhelming attack on the queen side, which is, you know, on the verge of collapse, is that nobody's there to guard the king. Hmm. Right? It's pretty, you know, it's pretty difficult. This bishop notice the queen's fastest traffic back to relevant squares would be through b7, and this bishop is unfortunately in the way. And never really came to life, right? Never really got anywhere. Okay, so very good. Knight to f7, same idea, but even more direct. Okay, and now um, black declined to take, but I think we have to look at why, right? So if black takes, we now have bishop h6, pin. But okay, okay, rook g8, right? I'm holding on, right? If you take, I'll take, no big deal. Okay, but now the same move as before, knight f4. And uh, I'm coming in on this square. And of course, the bishop cannot be moved to allow the rook to defend because pin. Okay, so um, the game might have finished, you know, in that situation, something like this probably would have been the conclusion. Um, I looked through this earlier, right? And uh, three pieces around the king, right, is almost always enough, and it is in this case. Um, you know, if he tries to save his rook, we have mate in one, knight on e6, and if he goes anywhere else, well, we can at very least pick up the rook, and we're still attacking him. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're still threatening to come in. Notice, um, you know, probably there's... Uh, no hope because uh, the knight guards d3. So the queen is not getting in too quickly. Here, I think probably I'm safe to just take this off. And one queen, scary though she is, is not enough to create a mating attack on her own. Not especially when you have to 
right? Play every move at instant speed to avoid losing immediately. Okay, so uh, quick wrap up, right? Um, Black had tried instead to keep his attack going on the queen side. We have this same pin, different direction, but same move. Okay, some exchanges, but now after queen g7, e8. Okay, this, unfortunately, you know, not with a bang, but a whimper. The end of this game is pretty easy to understand, um, I hope. Right, g5 trying to open up even more lines against the king, right? Just trying to create more sensitive squares. And especially if I take, right, then that's going to create a passer. Um, but black trying to avoid that only creates more opportunities to open lines. And after some shepherding of the king, right, we see why this was useful because, okay, the bishop comes open. Um, and Black resigned here, but it's probably worth mentioning why. So uh, after something like this, right, we can just trade everything off. Because unfortunately, even though, you know, piece, piece wise, it actually Black is ahead. This, uh, anyone, you know, even, even somebody who's reasonably new should be able to space invader these pawns up the board and make a queen, right? Okay. So an interesting game, uh, hopefully a good display of sort of the basics of this. Um, I'm happy to share this study with anybody who wants the link uh, so that you can look at this. I also actually included some extra games, um, including, you know, you're welcome to look at the Kasparov one where black plays more actively. Um, and then one of my own, which goes into a completely different line, uh, which I didn't have time for today. Um, this one's just kind of interesting. We look at a little bit of a different plan where white plays e3 right away, bishop e3, and um, how that system works. But um, yeah, I mean, any questions on any of that? <laughs> it's quite a lot, I know. Or just questions about chess in general. I've got time today. I moved this up earlier so that I could stay a few extra minutes. John, can I say uh, just a meta question in a sense? Um, roughly speaking, uh, the other things being equal, the general task for black, presumably, since it has to play the second move, is to try to achieve equality and then attack. Seems to me that the purpose of Sicilian is to get going sooner rather than later. Yes. It seemed to me in the course of the Spassky game that Spassky was concerned first and foremost with, or at least an important part of his strategy was to make sure he could counter or at least contain Black's attack before he then launched his pretty brutal attack. Does, does White sort of in this, in this opening kind of find himself in mirror position? He has to first, first count, make sure he's got Black contained in Sicilian before he launches, or is it really whoever gets there fastest with the mostest wins? It's, I would say it depends pretty heavily on the position. I would say that it is absolutely in the personality of the Sicilian that you very often end up with these um, imbalanced attacks, right? That I'm going for this and you're going for that and whoever executes it best wins. I would say that neither side can afford to lose time and in something like the dragon, right, that I was making reference to earlier, um, let me see if I can pull that up quickly. Okay, when you look at a position like this, which, you know, is not so different, but one of the critical things is that white has castled his king over here, right? I would say that these positions can often come down to a race where white has to do the minimum amount to try and contain black's attack. He can't ignore it entirely, but most of the game has to be about white trying to jump Harry the H-pawn up the board as quickly as possible, right? Get this file open, trade this bishop off, and use the open H-file to try and checkmate, right? And part of the reason for that, if you're looking for like, but why? is because both sides in this opening are playing for checkmate, 
One of the things that kind of saves Spassky in that particular game, and frankly, saved me in this game, right, against this, uh, <laughs> this 1900 player, right, 1874, um, right, was a similar thing, that white is playing for checkmate and black is playing for an eventual queenside win. It's not, that's not to say that black's way of playing is inferior. I mean, you can win this way, and he almost did. But, you know, what's kind of nice about being the guy playing for checkmate is the burden of mistake is usually on the other player, right? Usually the mistakes are going to cost him more heavily. And so that's maybe a way to judge between the two. When, when, have it, you know, when do I need to go for glory, and when do I need to contain the other guy's attack? Well, right, there's some calculation involved. But basically, you know, if you can calculate it so you – can start making mating threats before the other guys, um, before the other guys' attack gets really serious. Well, then you have to go for it, right? You can't afford to lose any time. But weighing those things out, I think it's much more about experience than anything else. I think you have to develop a feel. Um, the other thing that I really love here, and then I'll, you know, uh, I think that's plenty, is. Um, the closed Sicilian, I think you can get away a lot more with understanding the basic plans, where in the dragon and other open Sicilians, you really have to know the theory. You've got to be the sort of person who likes to sit down and memorize openings to play that stuff. This is something you can play and you can pick it up, and you can start playing immediately, and you can be bad at it, but you can figure it out with experience and not so much have to memorize. And I think that's much more attractive for people who are not already um, addicted to chess. I love memorizing stuff. You know, I'm, I'm a theory junkie, and I get really into it, but I don't think it's best for most people. Um, what else? Anybody else? I got a question. Hey, John, yeah. how are you, man? It's good hey. to see you. Yeah. Um, B3, uh, I just general question. Um, yeah. Please. For opening, opening on the white side. Mm -hmm. Is, um, what do you think about B3 or G3? This stuff? Yeah, those, those two openings. B3 um, or G3, is either better? Is it, what do you think? Um, I think, so I would say, uh, I'm going to, I'll try and, you know, be a little, briefer and so maybe we can take a couple more if other people have questions what i would say here dave is and first of all thank you so much for coming um oh my pleasure man this is a lot of fun good good i'm glad um what i would say about stuff like this is um to me i i, I don't have a lot of respect for it <laughs> 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 which is which is completely unfair and ridiculous. You know, like this is not, this, I'm just decided to be free with my own opinion. You know, you're coming here, you're, I'm gonna tell you what I think. Yeah, um, it. It's, you know, white has more aggressive ways to play. Um, and, you know, certainly there's nothing like fatally wrong. I mean, this is the advantage of playing white is that you can, um, you can do things like this, right? And I like, playing the major openings. I like being sort of feeling like a part of chess history and playing these things that have been played for hundreds of years. Um, why is this not played as often? Um, and, you know, G3 kind of similar. Basically, you know, I would say that uh, Bishop B2, because it kind of allows Black a free hand in the center, right? And same thing here. We are going to develop and we are going to get some peace control, but because we're not occupying the center with pawns, right, we are giving black opportunities to kind of play white in a sense. Right. Right. We're letting him have the center. So what I would say now, before I talk too negatively, okay, what's the advantage? <laughs> Playing something a little offbeat, your opponent, if they are a memorizer, is going to be completely out of book on move one. Okay. Um, and you get a lot of opportunity as a result to play chess, right? I mean, I always joke, like, of course, we're playing chess through the whole thing. But if you're still in book, if you're still through your preparation and your memorization, you're really not playing yet. So the advantage of playing something like B3 is you might, you know, force your opponent to have to play the game right from the beginning. And maybe that means you end up understanding things 
better because you're not relying on something that you've memorized and you're also forcing them to do the same. So I think there can be a lot of merit in stuff like this, especially starting out, right? Um, if you're trying to avoid projects. But for me, I don't, you know, I don't play it. And it, when people play this stuff against me, I admit that I get like in, incredibly motivated to just crush them. <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, I don't know, you know, that's like completely illogical and unfair, but that's the honesty of my reaction. I love it. Thanks, are man. there opening moves that are straight up wrong? Can I talk? Yeah. Oh, good. I didn't know if I was unmuted or not. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not nearly as good at chess as you, and I can totally see how, like, the patterns just play out in your mind ahead of the game. Yeah. But, like, are there opening moves that somebody does, and you're just like, okay, I win, because I can totally see how this is going. It seems too um, complex to read it that far. It, it definitely is, yes. And I think that actually, Ryan, that's a, a completely valid point. And, and I want to make sure, like, what I just said, Dave, was my opinion, you know? Um, you can play anything you want, and you can make it work. I talked about this in lecture one, that, uh, that this guy, Tony Miles, is this British player um, with kind of like a, a mischievous attitude. He played... Uh, was he still world champion? I think he might have been still world champion, but he was at least a former world champion, Anatoly Karpov. And I think Karpov played E4 and he played 1A6. <laughs> and, he won, and he won the game. You know, so this is like, when we think people, about controlling the set and developing our pieces. So it's got to be, it's got to be quite a tell if somebody does that. It's, yeah, I mean, it's like kind of a troll job. But you know? <laughs> I guess my question is, is that, is that because there are just cultural, like, embedded, like, the Sicilian defense that you're supposed to do every time? Or is this move strictly worse? Um, no, it's definitely not because of cultural expectations. It's because, um, let's put it this way. Surprise value is only worth so much. And... Yeah. You have perfect um, information. So, like, okay, to go back to Dave's question, right, like, this, I think in these kinds of games, after B3, the better player is going to win, huh. okay? Um, if you are playing someone who is not as good as you, therefore, you might say, well, I think John just told me I should be playing this. Yeah, that's kind right? of... <laughs> right? But if, but if you're playing someone stronger... It might seem good to take them out of theory, but like you might actually have better success trying to play like a plan to, t you know what I mean? You might actually have better success against a stronger player being like, yeah, but have you ever seen this little sequence? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you might be better off trying to hold serve as white. That's another way to think of it, Dave, actually, is, is by playing white, you have the serve. And when you play B3, you're kind of more the kind of player that's just trying to lob it in and then win on the volley. Yeah. Right? And I have always been the kind of player that is trying to blow it past you at 90 miles an hour. Yeah, it's not aggressive at all. And yeah, that's just, it, that's just yeah. how I like to play. John? Yes. Somewhat along these lines, um, and of course it's a, very, it's a much different move, but correct me again if I'm wrong, but Fisher, at least in the fisher Spassky era, was allegedly known for quote always playing e4 uh yeah, that's by test fisher said one of the so-called surprise moves not the same thing as uh you know a as uh, as a six was in game three or four against spassky he plays d4 mm -hmm. and if you want to talk about surprise moves it's probably at least in that context uber surprising because what the hell was he doing yeah F yeah, I mean, Spassky had, had probably, you know, it's like some of that's invested, I think, with a little bit of false drama because Boris Spassky was world champion. He had played many games against D4, you know? His specific preparation against Fisher had not included this move. And so I'm sure it did cause him some legitimate stress because he, at that point, had no idea what Fisher was going to go into. But it wasn't as though, you know, his circuits were fried. <laughs> I had never imagined that he would make the other most popular move. 
No, right? but it might have been Tony Miles-ish in the sense that uh, you think you know where I'm coming from. I'm just going to mess with you some more. I absolutely think that Fisher was trying to do that. Yes, I do agree with that. Um, I absolutely do. There was another thought that I had there, actually, but I, that's all right. If it comes back to me. Um, well, I know I've gone on for quite a while here, um, but, you know, I'm free. I've got another few minutes here. Um, I have to draw a hard line at two, but if people have more questions, um, yeah. please. You know, it's it's very cool. Uh, I'm very, very new to <laughs> chess. I literally, I, play, I know how to play, you know, and I have a little bit of, of understanding and stuff, but it, when it comes to theory and um, uh, whatnot, I... Yeah. I'm very, I'm excited to kind of, I'm like opening it up. And this is great because a lot of this is over my head at the moment, but. Yeah, this, t the today, you know, go back and watch the other two. Yeah. <laughs> today well, I kind of went it. for it, but go on. But what's great is that you've really shown me, I've, I've got a visual idea of, this is, this is what I want things even just to look like. As I'm saying, I, like building yes. a foundation of what is, what is my first, you know, four or five moves going to look like. Um, especially if I'm if I'm playing white, that I can I can build up this initial defense, yes. and where I go from there is going to be trial and error and fun and whatnot to figure it out. But this is, uh, it's very cool. And it wasn't so over the head that I felt like I was completely lost. I'm like, no, 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 I get it. I see where we're, we're where we're going and stuff. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's I I really appreciate the uh, good. I you know what? Can you just jog my memory there? Thank you. Um, one of the other things I wanted to say. So despite, despite the focus of this particular lecture, I actually advise all of my students, everyone, if you are going to memorize an opening, and Dave, this goes back to you actually, with, with the B3 stuff. If you wanna play B3 as white, go right ahead. And the main reason is, like I said earlier, because you have that first move advantage, you can get away with things. When you are playing black, you have to know what you're doing. <laughs> Right. When my students come back, I go to tournaments all the time. Right. I go to um, I mean, I don't actually get to play in that many myself. Right. But my students, you know, I'm, I'm there with them and I'm coaching and basically coaching at a chess tournament only. You're not allowed to talk to the players during games. So it only amounts to postmortem analysis. Right. They come back with the result. We go over it. I give them a few pointers and then they rest because there's another round coming. And one of the things that I see over and over again is when my good, dedicated chess players, nine and 10 years old, but they're, you know, 1,100, 1,200 rating, right? They're doing really well. When they come back and they lost in 12 moves, it is almost always as black. And I want to take those games away as quickly as possible. And, and to me, the reason is because it's not about losing. You know, hopefully I've, I've made that point already. Like, you have to embrace losing you have to not take losing as you know an indicator of whether or not this game is for you you know um but just use the information try and learn one more move in your opening right try and find where the mistakes were and and learn from them but when you lose in 12 moves the real danger is that you just start hating chess and especially when you're nine that's very common so I always grind my players on their, their black openings because you do not have that first move advantage. White is coming for you. All of these kids love these little memorized attacks. They are very into let me go get them immediately. You know, um, so if you're going to devote time to the opening, which frankly, I think you should spend more time on middle game and tactics, but spend it on your black openings and I promise you, you will get more enjoyment out of the game. 